Leviticus outlines instructions that are necessary for God to dwell in the midst of them in a non-destructive way. Deuteronomy outlines what is necessary for life in the land and for blessing. Key points are that Yahweh alone is the God of Israel, and he should only be worshipped in the place he causes his name to dwell. This later comes to be Jerusalem, so there is to be just one place of worship. We will see that that is not what actually happens for a very long time. Observing both of these commands is necessary for life in the land. If they are observed, there will be blessing. Not observing will bring curses. Deuteronomy is mostly structured as a kind of covenant renewal. A covenant renewal that comes after the wilderness wanderings and there is a new generation and they are poised to go into Canaan. And so the covenant must be re, uh, renewed. As we've seen before, these covenants follow a basic structure, an introduction, historical background, the conditions of the covenant, the commands to, pub to publish in some way the covenant, the givings of blessings and curses, and witnesses. Now Deuteronomy is a little bit different than say the covenant making at Exodus because Exodus does not really go into blessings and curses and no witnesses are given because God alone is a witness. So there are some differences here in this covenant renewal ceremony. The introduction to this is the law this is the law that Moses set before the Israelites then there is historical background the Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb not with our ancestors did the Lord make this covenant but with us who are all of us here alive today the Lord spoke with you face to face at the mountain out of the fire now notice here it says Horeb rather than Sinai. There seems to have been a different naming tradition. The conditions of the covenant follow in chapters 5 through 26. There is first an exhortation to Israel in chapters 5 through 11 by Moses. And part of that is the giving of the Decalogue the Ten Commandments, with some differences from what we find in Exodus. So here's a table that shows the Decalogue in Exodus and that in Deuteronomy. Notice that regarding the Sabbath day, one difference is the introduction. In Exodus it simply says, Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Deuteronomy expands that a little bit. Observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Further down, it in Exodus, it mentions that nothing belonging to you shall do any work, including your livestock. This is expanded in Deuteronomy to be very specific, or your ox, or your donkey, or any of your livestock. And even though in both of them it is specifically said that a male or female slave shall do no work, here it expands on that, so that your male and female slave may rest as well as you. So it emphasizes 
rest for all. The rationale for Sabbath is different. This is perhaps the biggest difference between the two Decalogues. In Exodus, it is connected with creation. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. In Deuteronomy, the rationale has to do with Israel's former state of slavery in Egypt. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath. It is a mark of basically of a slave never to have rest. But in Deuteronomy and in Exodus, slaves are given rest. And so on those days, they are basically in the same state as everyone else. There are other differences for example, Deuteronomy tends to say the same thing but expands a little bit. So in the command to honor your father and mother, Exodus says, so that your days may be long. Deuteronomy expands that. Again, it adds the phrase, as the Lord your God commanded you, so that your days may be long and that it may go well with you. There is also ex an expansion on the law regarding coveting. In Exodus, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, wife, male or female slave, ox, donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. In Deuteronomy, it adds things like uh, their, uh, their field. Another part of this first section in, an, in the exhortation to the people by Moses, there is the Shema, probably the most famous of all of the confessional passages in the Old Testament. And it is continues to be foundational for Jews today and for Christians. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Notice that that word alone in verse 6, 4 has various translations. Sometimes it is translated um, one. Um, the word actually is echad, meaning one. So there are various ways of understanding it. But it is clear that only the Lord is to be your God. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite, recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. This is what gives rise to the Jewish practice of having a, a little container on the wall of the house on the doorpost with scripture inside of it. This is called the mezuzah. And on the bottom, these are phylacteries or tefillin. These are little boxes with scripture passages inside that at different ceremonial times or different times of the day are worn on the forehead. 